Now joining us now to discuss business rescue strategies is Louis Faniker, Director and Turnaround Specialist for Business 911. Now let's start on this point that you've mentioned that about twin, um, liquidations currently standing at about 24%. How did this business rescue um, idea come about? Well, business rescue is really modeled on um, Chapter 11 in the United States, which has shown mixed results. Average company that um, goes into Chapter 11, 30% of them actually gets rescued. So the idea is where liquidation was before the only option for an ailing company. Um, business rescue is brought in under Chapter 6 in, in uh, the South African Companies Act to allow for an, a means to save jobs. That's the prime objective, to get jobs saved. But what would you say are the red flags for a company to go under this process? Well, there are quite a few obvious ones. The first ones, and I always talk to, to uh, uh, landlords, um, companies start missing their, their lease payments. They start missing their pay as you earn and VAT payments. And th those are the first red flags. And I always say companies wait too long. They tend to wait until they, without resources, to be able to apply resources to, to uh, get the turnaround going. And then they think business rescue is a magic wand that can save them, where really business rescue is a step between failing and a hope to save jobs. So I, I always plead with companies, when you see the red signs, even if you're the creditor, if you're the landlord, mm. put up the flag and say, you ought to talk to a turnaround specialist. So is it the sort of thing where you save the person from drowning, but doesn't mean you teach them to swim? Absolutely. I mean, uh, you, so t well, give us a typical picture of a business that's in trouble. They go for business rescue, having listened to the warning signals. What happens? What does it look like? Well, it depends on which stage they go in, David. I mean, that's the, that's the wonderful thing. If, if they go early enough, um, typically they need a bit of perspective. They need possibly to have a relook at their business model. It's rare if you go early enough and the, and the business was a profitable business uh, and the business model is sound, they may have had a shock. There may have been some event that have given them a shock and they've just not recovered from that. And a fresh perspective with cost cutting or realignment of the business model normally saves them. The trouble is, and it's mostly private companies, because remember, close to 87% is pri private companies and CCs that are going into liquidation and, and into business rescue, not liquidation. So you tend to see that there's no corporate governance, there is no no shareholder looking over their shoulders and they wait too long mm. and then they involve the rescue practitioner or the turnaround specialist and as much as you try very often you don't have the resources I was in, involved in a matter where we simply didn't have the cash to pay certain key uh, individuals that we needed in order to turn this business and that's the challenge so again the flag or the, the my big uh, gospel that I'm trying to preach is don't wait too long. Mm. There's no harm in asking someone, do I need a turnaround? You can always say, well, we look fine. Mm. We will be okay. But if you wait too long, you might die. Mm. That's what it comes to. Well, we saw a case with the low-cost airline one time. I mean, they were in the business rescue process. And after two months, that collapsed. What are the reasons behind something? Like, and how could they have avoided it? So very happy that you mentioned one time. Because one time is the one beacon that people who don't want to go into business rescue put up and say, see, it doesn't work. Mm. There are lots of reasons why one time f failed, and I don't think we can really go into that here. Um, you've got to see in perspective the 30% that the US have. Okay? That's, that's not a massive success rate. And business rescue is a very, very young process in South Africa. It's just over two and a half years. And in the first year, 8% of companies who went into rescue were saved. In the second year, 12% of companies were saved. So we, we're in the growing phase where we have to learn there's a legal precedence being set but I'm very positive that Business Rescue will actually mm. do what it's set out to do. There are have a lot of challenges, mm. but, but we'll get there. Have you got a number for since the legislation started working? You said three and a half years, it's how long it's been. Two, two and a half. Yeah. Two and a half hour. Uh, how many jobs have been saved that would otherwise have been lost based on past experience? David, I wish I had. Roughly. Yeah. Um, Is it hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands? I, I would think it's, it's tens of thousands at the moment, um, given the profile of companies that are going into rescue, because sadly, the large companies that have gone into rescue, like one time, are the ones that failed. So mm. sadly, they contributed, and, and they also contributed to the public opinion. Mm. I mean, the people but that I approach, they often say, I don't want to go into rescue because I don't want to have your one time. Are you just doing what the management should have done? In other words, they couldn't see it, or they didn't have the courage, or they were pretending that somehow something would turn up that would help them. You come in cold and hard, and you say, OK, I can see what needs to be done here. Or are you able to do different things because of the legislation allows you to do? I think... I think it's not so much the legislation. I think very often private companies have a history of being a trading company. Very often family businesses and they're traders. 
and they tend to not understand the subtleties of, of having to manage large corporations. And they, they run out of talent. That's really what happens. And they somehow mull along. And very often we come in with business experience and business skills and we see the obvious things. We look at the balance sheets, we look at the income statements, we look at the operations, and it's clear as daylight where the actual issues are. And with enough resources, if you're early, you can very quickly, within three months, put sustainable changes in place. Mm. You don't even have to, need to change management very often just to realign the company toward an upwards uh, pro uh, growth. Yeah. So again, the challenge is, if you look at the high number of companies, uh, pr private companies and CCs that go into rescue, it tells you that it's an absence of skill very often. They know how to run a business. I mean, the one matter that I was in, they made profits, but in retrospect, I showed them that they should have made much more profits, but they thought they were successful. And as soon as the economy turned against them, yeah. they didn't know what to do. And that's when you need real skill yeah. um, that can just help them, realign them, show them the way, and then they, they go. Yeah. We saw another case with Velvet Sky, another low-cost airline company that went to court and wanted to be under business rescue, but the court said no. What could they have done differently? Well, I'm not, I'm not too sure about the details of the Velvet Sky matter, but I do know the courts are not simply just allowing everybody to go into to business rescue. There is, you've got to understand the two objectives, um, saving jobs, but also protecting creditor um, value. Yeah. So, you know, I've been in, in many matters where we actually advised against business rescue. And we said, look, there's no way you've got an ailing uh, business model and, and there's nothing that we can do to actually save you. Yeah. It's best to protect cre creditor value by going into liquidation. But Lou, you must have an interesting profile because you're a troubleshooter for these companies. You've got to go in, but they're different. It's not like you're an airline expert sure. who's going into airline companies. Sure. Uh, where did you get all this expertise? Because in effect, you're an all-round troubleshooter. Sure. Now, look, I've got 16 years in, in, in business um, management, uh, in, in fact, business consulting. I've been very fortunate. I had a two and a half year stint with, with First Rand, where I firsthand had to, I don't know if you recall around the 2000s, there was a major retrenchment in First Rand, and I was the guy who had to do the turnaround in terms of the culture, to get the people on board, mm -hmm. get them to believe in the company again. That's this a tough job. This whole help, how can we help you mm -hmm. exercise? I implemented the culture change program. So it helps to have had to do it firsthand to try and change a big ship, otherwise you're a bit naive. But it, it comes down to the diversity, because business, business acumen is business acumen. And, and very often, there are just simple stuff. You can't buy something for 12 rand and sell it for 10 and think you can make money. Or sell it, buy it for 12 rand, sell it for 13 but your costs are two and very often the guys can't see the woods for the trees. Mm.